So we start again with the next uh, session uh, that is entitled Dirty Cables, the Technology and Politics of Network Infrastructure. So I would like to call now on stage uh, all the people that will be part of the panel. Uh, first of all, Anna Biselli, that is the moderator. And then uh, Moritz Metz, Mark Helmus, Anne Roth. And uh, I will put myself here so I'm not in the middle. Um, I just want to introduce briefly Anna. Uh, she's uh, writing for uh, netspolitik.org, that is one of the most influential political blogs in Germany. And uh, before joining uh, Netspolitik, she studied computer science. Uh, during her studies, uh, uh, she started to dig into political issues uh, arising with technological developments like big data and artificial intelligence. Then I will leave to you the duty to introduce the speaker. I just want to say also something that I think is uh, interesting if you want to go a bit more in depth into that, because this panel is uh, also connected in time and space with another panel that we had uh, uh, at the end of May in Linz uh, at the Art Meets Radical Openness Festival, in which we also invited Anne Roth. And uh, uh, we also had uh, Matthew Rice there from Privacy International and Fike Janssen from Tactical Tech. And the video is already recorded that exists on our uh, YouTube channel. So if you also want to uh, get to know a bit more about what we say in that situation, we were already speaking about cable infrastructure and also the temporal uh, program uh, uh, thanks to the privacy international presence uh, and also the interference of the corporation into the cable infrastructure, thanks to the presence of uh, FIKE. So now I want to leave it to you and thanks a lot for being here. So the idea would be that uh, Anna will introduce the speakers, then we will go on with the presentations uh, and at the end they will all come back on stage for the question and answer. Thank you. Okay, hello and thank you all for coming. I'm very glad to moderate this panel because it's kind of trying to get a connection between like these physical things, like the technological problems and structures of the internet and the political things because like, as you heard from my background, this is also kind of a thing that's always been bothering me because I think that if you don't know about like the technical backgrounds and the realities, then you can't make like wise political decisions and when Trevor was speaking about like the bad metaphors, I think that's showing that a lot of people don't know about the technical realities. That's also like one bad metaphor we also always see is like this data highway for the internet and stuff like this. And I hope we can connect those issues and therefore we have, I think, really good speakers today. And like the first one will be Moritz, who will give us like a presentation about his project, like where the internet lives. I think you heard, if you've been to the keynote, some like aspects of it before. And he also does like a lot of radio stuff. He's a freelance radio reporter, editor, producer, and also does podcasts. And like for the German speakers, I can really advise you to listen to his show, like Netzbastel, which is very interesting and is like uh, bi-weekly, I think. Yep. And like the second speaker, like coming from the really technological perspective is Mark Helmus. Mark Helmus has worked like as a network engineer for German network operators and he has like a deep knowledge which concerns like fiber optic cables and stuff like this. And he's been planning and building transport networks for almost 20 years now and especially passive infrastructures and lives in Hamburg and Essen. Like the third speaker who will connect the political sphere with the technological sphere is Anne Roth. She's like a political scientist and has been working like on this interface of digital rights and politics and technology for a long time. She co-founded like Indie Media, an interactive media activist platform, which is there since 2001 and has been involved with a lot of projects. For example, also as an editor and researcher in the technical Tactical Tech Collective and developed their educational material for activists to protect themselves in the digital world. 
and now she's an advisor for the parliamentary inquiry of mass surveillance in the German parliament and is working there for the left party. And yeah, with that, I want to pass the microphone to the first speaker, Moritz. Thank you. So uh, first of all, also let me th say thank you to the organizers. Um, it's really great that all uh, of us who are the Internet Explorers um, come together because it's the first time and it's really interesting for us to listen to each other's talk. Like me and Hendrik, we, we, we work together, but still we never saw each other's talk. And uh, it was also interesting to, uh, to see Trevor's talk because I never saw it and we still share some slides coincidentally. So my, some stuff of what I will show you today will also, uh, you will already know because Hendrik uh, showed it already, then I will go a little bit faster and move on to the next things. All right. I'm a radio journalist as I said, and um, f the first time in when I thought about the internet and places was in 2005 when I met a guy. I was working at a record label and that guy was working there too and um, he just came from Antigua, that island uh, in the Caribbean where um, all the gambling and internet roulette and uh, betting websites are hosted because they have a different legislation that leads to um, many US citizens moving there and working there on that island, like in paradise, he also came back very rich. He was an Israeli guy and he wanted to con convince me to work for him and to do some, to build some websites for that, uh, for Antigua and for um, roulette and gambling. I didn't want to do that, but I was interested in, in it anyways because um, it showed that the internet crosses borders and there's borders and legislation, territories and so there's the internet and especially in that time it wasn't very evolved that um, you could just uh, host a website somewhere else and then it was legal and, and still uh, all the US citizen was, uh, citizens would, would lose their money in Antigua. So uh, then I continued thinking about the internet and of course you know that very famous citation, now it's German, quickly. Sound isn't switched on but you still know it. Um, das Internet ist für uns alle Neuland. And um, this is this metaphor. Uh, Merkel is using that very famous metaphor, and uh, Neuland means like uncharted territory, newly reclaimed land, something like that. The, the Internet is a new arena for us. And why does she describe it with some place that you go to? There's even one more, das even me, more weird description of the Internet. And again, the Internet. It's not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. So that's uh, Senator Ted Stevens who said the internet is a series of tubes. And then there's a uh, famous German tennis player, Boris Becker, who said... Um, well, Ehrlich, ich verstehe absolut null. That was an advertisement in the 90s when he was um, advertising for America Online and those CDs that you could get everywhere. Bin ich da schon drin oder was? And that's really famous because he said... Ich bin drin. Ich bin drin, das which ist means einfach. so einfach ist das. It means I'm inside already. Nowadays, you don't go to the internet, you don't dial in because you're already online all the time, and you have the internet. Actually, it's in you because it's in your pocket. Your phone is already there and it's already connected to the internet. So today we have another relationship with the internet. Today we have those. There's even things like that that you make yourself comfortable with the internet, with the tablet PC. And then there's this other word, the cloud, but. It's really a foggy word, I would say. No one really knows where it is, whereas um, that logo for the cloud is always the same. Um, <laughs> so um, I was working for German National Public Radio, for different stations, and for uh, German Franco-German TV station Arte, and just trying to find where the internet lives. That was my project. This is my internet router back at home. So I s somehow have the same approach as Andrew, who's going to talk tomorrow. Um, this is my backyard, and one day there was this um, telco guy coming to install some new DSL internet line. This is a really Berlin guy, a real Berliner. This is uh, where my internet lands, and this is where he opens it, and then he tries to find out which of those cables is mine. Oh, natürlich ist das hier nicht Punkt 13, sondern der heißt Punkt 11. 
So that's point 11. And then uh, I was following the internet with him on the streets. Uh, if you have a look, uh, if you take care, uh, then you will see all these manholes um, that show the internet. Then I was also talking to some cable workers. It's also German, but I promise it's one of the last German. I have already done a cable cut. It's passiert schon mal. Zumal auch schon mal ein Stromkabel auch schon kaputt und Kabel Deutschland haben wir auch schon kaputt gekriegt. Passiert immer wieder irgendwo. So he says, well, we destroyed cables from some times from time to time and also Cable Deutschland, which is one provider. Uh, yeah, it happens. So um, this is uh, where uh, the D-slam, where my internet connection ends. This is uh, the guy just um, fixing it there. And um, this is Andrew just yesterday. Um, my colleague, let's say colleague, um, and we uh, did a small tour through Berlin because then I wanted to see where does it go from that uh, D-slam box just in my street. And maybe it goes to a place like this, it goes to another place because this is in Schöneberg, but this house is very famous. It's Fernmeldeamt 1, uh, telecommunica Telecommunication Office 1 or so. Um, it was built in, in the 20s and uh, was the biggest of its kind in whole Europe. It, uh, it looked like this. There was thousands of people working inside um, doing phone connections. And um, there was one record in 1974 when almost 5,000 Berliners wanted to uh, call, uh, won wanted wake up calls from that uh, house in the morning at six o'clock in the morning because they didn't want to miss the boxing fight between Muhammad Ali and Joe Fraser. <laughs> so that happened, but what also happened is um, surveillance. So uh, for example, after Second World War, the Allied troops did quite a lot of surveillance from that house. They also built some radio stations um, there. And I think the architecture, if you look at that house, it, it has that look that maybe shows you that the state who owns the telecommunication um, has a lot of power. So um, continuing um, in Berlin, there's a lot of different other data centers, about 15 or so. I was trying to photograph them all. I also started one Google Map project that you can contribute to if you want to. Um, I can give you the URL later. So th these are just some um, random data centers in Berlin. I w just went there and took photos. Um, and I like that it's really boring. It's, you know, you, first you have to find them. It's kind of an art finding these data centers. Uh, some of them are already on maps, but then once you find them, you see the surveillance cameras, and sometimes you even hear the sound. This is where my server is located at. It's a Strato a hosting provider, and uh, my domain where the internet lives is hosted basically there in that uh, very high building, and you can almost hear where the internet lives there. Um, also many surveillance cameras, these are those manholes, you can see them everywhere in front of all these houses, another data center. This is another almost secret data center, it's in Spandau and this is probably where Google is so, uh, also co-locating their servers. And if we step up one more level then we see uh, how the internet looks like uh, in Europe. This is just a network of the company Level 3. And um, everyone knows now that in Frankfurt, there's this big data center hub, um, DKIX, which is the biggest in the world. And I met those guys, Arnold Nipper and Harald Summer, with, who are the managers. And they're nice geeks. And I wanted to ask them um, if I can look at their internet hub, DKIX. But they didn't allow me, because it was just one month after the first Snowden Prism um, leaks. So I, I asked them. Uh, why uh, can I, can't I go inside? Wollen Sie mir sagen, warum? Wir sind derzeit am Umbauen. So they didn't say anything, and then they said, well, oh, we have constructions going on. But, but of course, they didn't want to let me in because of um, maybe BND uh, wiretapping there. Um, BND, the uh, German secret service, is allowed to wiretap about 20% of the foreign internet traffic that uh, occurs at DKIX. Actually, um, what they did to label it foreign is that they labeled DKIX as a uh, virtual foreign place, some, something like this. And uh, in even that legislation period, they're trying to get more. That I think Anne can tell much more about that. Um, later. So uh, I wasn't allowed to get into that data center um, uh, or one of the DKEX data centers in Frankfurt, so I tried to find it on my, um, by, on my own. And what I found is that uh, fast food chain, and I asked him <laughs> if the internet lives there. 
Willkommen, Mike, die Umstellung, bitte. Mittel. Kommt noch was dazu? Das ist alles. Ich habe aber noch eine Frage. Ja? Ist bei Ihnen das, äh, wissen Sie, ob hier das Internet ist? Also so nebendran? Wie? Ist nebendran so ein Internetknoten? Internet? <laughs> so that proves that almost these internet places are really very well hidden and no one knows it because it's not important. But on the other hand, you all have been there at DKIX today, um, if you were online. So I found those chillers on, on the roof uh, on Google Maps and they look like this. This is what they use for cooling the data centers and uh, all the, the heat of the computers um, down. And so I could ident identify where uh, that one data center was. What I also found <laughs> is that construction sites, uh, that construction site and some cable uh, beyond. And that just proves that the internet often isn't very well protected, I would say. This slide uh, you already saw that afternoon. Um, this place we will talk about later. This is in Norden, and uh, this is one of the cables uh, that will connect uh, Europe with the United States. That's the new Maria cable that was just announced. It's a collaboration between Facebook and Microsoft. They will spend $200 million on that long cable, which, is, which will be the fastest one between Europe and the United States. And what's interesting about that is that um, in earlier times, there was only like 10% of um, cables that were operate, operated by private companies on their own. Now it's almost two thirds. Let's talk about that later too. Internet um, cables have some enemies like those. This is why they're really strong. And um, the next step of my research, finding the internet, was uh, flying to the United States with my friend and colleague, Henrik, who just talked. And uh, we went to the place where the internet was like invented, or where the first internet connection was, in that room. Now, you just walked into the 1960s. Do you feel it? The color? You're supposed to have gone back to when I was a young man. <laughs> So that's Leonard Kleinrock, and in 1969, he's a professor in uh, Los Angeles at the university there, and this computer is like an internet router, and that's the first, uh, that router made the first internet connection from LA to Stanford Research Institute in Silicon Valley. Um, that machine over there is the first piece of internet equipment ever. And so I can ask you a question. How many revolutions do you know where you could say exactly when it began and exactly where it began within four square feet. Not too many, but here you can. So you see he's really proud of the past. Um, this is when they, uh, this is how they looked like when they uh, started uh, with the internet. It was actually called the ARPANET. And what they wanted to do is uh, send some letters, uh, log in, the letters L-O-G-I-N, uh, from LA to Stanford, and actually they failed. We had a telephone connection from Charlie to Bill. So Charlie typed the L and he said, you get the L? Bill said, got the L. Type the O, you get the O? Got the O. Type the G, you get the G? Crash. The network went down. So what was the first message ever on the internet? Low, as in, lo and behold. So he's also very proud of that. <laughs> he's giving talks and he gets medals for uh, having uh, built the first internet connection that crashed. This is how the computers looked like in that time, the terminals, and he had one of his uh, of those smartphones with a voice assistant. And I asked him, hey, okay, now, maybe you can tell me where does the internet live? And he just gave that question to his phone. Where does the internet live? That's difficult to answer. Let me search the internet for you. That's very funny, but you got it wrong. So uh, the machine offering uh, that it searches the internet for where the internet lives. Um, this is how the ARPANET looked like in the 70s. This is how the internet looks today. This is San Luis Obispo. Henrik has been talking about that already. It's famous for uh, bubblegum alley. For bubblegum alley, this is a place where everyone can stick their bubble gums. It's not so famous for those um, internet connections that go to basically Asia. And we went to that place that, as Henrik already mentioned, looked like uh, Windows 95. But uh, we liked it because we are internet explorers. So um, we, had, uh, we saw these mine holes. We found that station that's really well pro protected. Um, 
that's already like a legend to me, that moment when we went there, right? Um, then I was talking to that guy, Frank. at and Frank here, how can I help you? Hello, this is Moritz and Henrik. We're two journalists and poets. Um, we want to know where the internet is. Is it in here? No, I'm afraid not. Why? Oh, no, no. no this is actually a secure uh, at and location. We, there, we can't really have you come in here. Yeah, but so could you come out? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I okay, he couldn't come out either. So we took Bloody Nose Trail, which is close to cable trail down the beach and uh, we found the cables. No. Uh, <laughs> these, are <laughs> these are just unwatered plants. And, uh, but w what we found was that little house. We found those manholes and the camera. And I made it quick here, but uh, that was the first time re we really felt that magic of, okay, here uh, it's an important place, but no one knows. And uh, we were really happy. Um, then uh, another day in, uh, during that trip, I went alone to Silicon Valley to see where uh, those big companies, um, how they are connected to the internet. And uh, funny enough, they always have those min uh, little flags that connect, uh, that show where the cable is stick, and then they tell you, do not dig here, call before you dig. And this is how the Google um, headquarter is probably connected to the internet, not their servers, but the headquarter. Then I was trying to find out uh, where do those people live who, um, built the internet for us, and I was looking for the house of Larry Page, uh, one of the CEOs of Google, and uh, actually I found it, and uh, it was already dark, and I was standing in this house, and I took a picture of him because I thought, okay, he's taking pictures of our houses too, street view. Um, so I took a picture, and then he arrived by car, and I was really getting afraid <laughs> and moved away quickly, and I think he was as, as, as afraid as I was. Um, next, next house, <laughs> I went to was uh, the house of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, which uh, looks basically like this. And I was talking to a guy who was like, uh, he looked like a guard. Yes, I just wanted to know if this is the house where Mark lives. I can't say that. Huh? You can't say that. Yeah. Okay. So you're just staying here and taking care. Can you tell me anything? No. Nope. All okay. I can say is he can't be from this house to that house. So He can't. He denied that uh, Mark Zuckerberg's house, I mean, they all looked more or less the same, would be uh, this. Um, but what I found out later is that uh, Mark Zuckerberg bought uh, the four houses around anyways in order to have more privacy. People who are a little bit different than those internet billionaires are um, the people at archive.org. They have that famous internet travel way back machine. The, it's an archive for internet websites and what we found interesting about it is uh, its location. They are in the form former church. So meet Brewster Kale, who's the founder of archive.org. I feel with the internet what we're building in some ways is the global brain. That that idea that we're building something that's more than the pieces. It gives people uh, an ability to do things at a scale never possible before. So he's really in love with the internet, so are we. And what we found out is, uh, what we saw is that the actual servers that host the internet archive are just in that church room. Uh, when we think we should have what's valuable to us close to us. So our actual, our, the computers that make up the primary copy of the internet archive, which are millions of books, music, video, billions of web pages that are served to millions of people, actually live here in this building, this former church. Next visit was at Google, and this is Urs Hölzle and his dog. Urs is uh, the vice pres senior vice president for technical infrastructure at Google. It wasn't easy to get to talk to him, but um, they already started some campaign which was called uh, Where the Internet Lives. Strange enough, but we came, it with that, we came up with that first, right? Um, and they presented for the first time also maybe as a reaction to what... Um, happened to Andrew when he wanted to visit the Google data centers. They presented the Google data centers in a really nice way and uh, well photographed. And w we weren't allowed to get into one of those huge data centers, but um, we asked Urs to describe how uh, it feels inside. You can feel the hum and the noise that's made by the servers, right? By the fans, etc., that are all turning. And it really feels like a very, very physical thing, not an abstract you know, in silence, some lights are blinking, right? It's not in silence, right? You really feel the energy that's in the hall. 
So this is another picture of Google uh, showing their data centers, but what uh, some people found out on the internet is that those were actually uh, doctored. And actually it looks like this. You, know, you can see the, all the stickers on the screen of, the, of the, uh, that girl working in the data center, but uh, they wanted to look it even nicer than it looks. Um, as well, they published pictures of deer uh, very next to their data centers. <laughs> what they said is um, the internet, um, where animals feel comfortable, this is the feeling we should get probably. Uh, this is also where um, your data is safe. Google has a lot of data centers around the world. They're expanding. Now they're building a huge one in the Netherlands. Another place where they were supposed to build one is Kronstorf in Austria. I went there. Um, this is next to Linz. And um, there was a woman talking on the street, and I asked her, do you know what's going to be built here? No, I was not what Google was talking about. There will be was about, they said. It's like a television station or something. Or so, I don't Which is interesting, because she thought it would be like a TV station that's going to be built there. Because when she was young, there was a huge medium, wa uh, medium wave radio station from the 50s to, uh, in the 50s from the American occupiers. Um, And they built that radio station in Kronstorf in order to broadcast radio propaganda to Russia. Um, now the young people in Kronstorf, in that town, in that small village town, they learn English. I went to that kindergarten. I went to that kindergarten in Kronstorf because. Um, what they did when they heard that Google is going to buy 80 hectare of land in Kronstorf, the first one of the first thing they did is they hired a German English teacher at their kindergarten <laughs> for the future of the kids. So this is the major, and um, what he said um, in Austrian uh, was that um, they didn't know that cable that they have a place that's so suitable for internet data centers because they have. Um, data cables stuck on the uh, street, they have a river, and they have a lot of electricity stations. And um, then he showed me around and showed me also the area where Google bought a lot of land in order to build maybe one day a data center. Actually, they bought it almost, I think, seven or eight years ago. Nothing has ha ever happened. But they got fiber, so I asked him <laughs> if we could open that one. We see here a beton shaft mit einem Gusseisendeckel darauf und darunter läuft die da eine dieser Datenleitungen. Können wir da mal aufmachen? Um, leider nicht, das zugeschraubt sehe ich mit einem Imbusschlüssel. So, I was really interested in how the internet changes places. We went to the next person there in Kronsdorf. This is the um, Hackerbauer. He's not a hacker, but it comes from... <laughs> also, <we're laughs> kommt vom, vom Holzhacken, nicht vom Hacken. <laughs> it comes from chopping wood and uh, not from hacking. He is uh, one of the farmers that sold their land to Google in order to um, get a lot of money and then they bought new machines and these machines, they are self-driving. So it's interesting that uh, somehow one day there will be a data center that maybe controls the self-driving tractors um, from the farmer used that land for, um, for uh, growing food. The internet, uh, that's my thesis here, is makes um, the outskirts to the center. It, it de decentralizes. So um, he also got email and he's a, he was a great guy to meet. As well, um, the, that little village changed a lot because of Google. Uh, there were many houses, new houses built because everyone said, okay, if Google is coming to that little town, it must be good. Um, we built houses there. Um, another, <laughs> another place uh, which is also changed, which was a lot, uh, changed a lot by the internet is Gibraltar, that uh, rock in the south of Spain. I went there with Henrik. Um, It's that rock, and um, we stayed there uh, for two days, I think. And uh, Gibraltar is famous for hosting and for its, as well, uh, just like Antigua, its gambling companies and all the betting and sports companies because they have a different legislation and they are still part of EU if Brexit um, doesn't work out. Um, and they host a lot of gambling and sports betting companies, which means there's thousands of uh, North European people. European people working there and um, making a lot of money and paying high rents just like in Manhattan. Um, 
we tried, we were in my motor home here, and uh, we tried to find <laughs> the internet, and then we found by accident, someone pointed us at that tunnel, and we actually were even allowed to go inside. Because when you um, have a betting company, you must host your websites in um, Gibraltar, and there's not much space. There's even more space in tunnels than in, uh, uh, on the real surface of the rock. So they have a lot of tunnels, and we went in one of those tunnels, and it went smaller and smaller. And then we tried to, uh, yeah, we went, there was that security check. Your name, sir? Henrik and Moritz. So geographically, we're uh, 450 meters from the, the, the main road uh, inside the rock. Uh, we're about 350 meters from the top of the rock. So uh, that's 450 meters in the rock, and it looks like a ship because it was built by the marine uh, in the 40s, I guess, or the 30 or 30s, um, because it served as a um, nuclear safe um, command center for some famous people. Eisenhower himself lived here for six months, and he physically lived in the building. So of course Winston Churchill lived here as well for, for six weeks. So the two of them would live down here during the very very peak decision making times of the war. So I. I really searched a long time for where the internet lives. I was trying to get into data centers and this was actually the first big data center that, was, that I was about to go inside um, in that bunker that was um, used by Churchill and Eisenhower. Eisenhower. For, um, the data center looked like this. I would say it's a wild card picture. It sounded, um, it was really loud. It wasn't really that fascinating. And then I thought maybe the internet where the internet lives is maybe somewhere different. So I built a website that um, shows, if you open it, it shows where you are and it shows how you are connected to my server, which is in Berlin. And then I asked, I paid people on Emerson Mechanical Turk for telling where their internet connection from them to me goes. My connection goes from Texas via Berlin to woodasinternetlet.de. My name is Oliver Sherenko. I live in Howrah, West Bengal of India. And my connection goes from Berlin. Hello, not in a Telamaria, in a cup of Tulli. You can also be a good watch and all the time. So these are all people talking about where the internet lives and when I f for the first time held that talk about uh, my research um, I found out that actually the internet is not so much the technical parts, it's rather the people. And um, after my talk I was contacted by some people, for example Mark who's going to talk next and he uh, for example pointed me at other places that are like the body of the internet and um, this is one of them. This is the TAT14 cable. I put that Neuland sticker on it <laughs> as a joke, but I removed it afterwards. Um, this is the TAT14 cable uh, house just uh, in the north of Germany. Um, but I think the internet doesn't live so much in its infrastructure. It rather lives in, in the people who use it and who fill it up. This is, for example, John Perry Barlow, who we were allowed to visit and to meet. He wrote the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace in 1996. This is Elektra Wagenrath from Berlin, who runs, who runs Freifunk. Uh, she's an activist for wireless networks in Berlin. And I think these people are where the internet lives. We are the internet, and we have to take care for it. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Mark Helmus. I hope the resolution works fine, everyone can see. 
So, um, I did some script. As the largest audience, I'm usually talking in front of my children, the three ones, and um, also they should use a microphone. Um, I work as a network engineer for German network operator, and I got in touch with Henrik and um, Moritz, I guess it was in 2014, as um, we got in touch by, by Twitter, as, I far, as far as I remember. I remember. And um, Moritz um, started his tour, Where the Internet Lives, and I thought I'm working um, with this infrastructure. I have been working with this um, for about 20 years. And um, I always thought it was ubiquitary for me. It was there, I worked with it, I earned my money with that. It's also not a secret. And I um, thought it could be pretty interesting um, to show what is behind the orange doors Henrik showed, what is inside the Jäger houses from t 14 And I also started uh, taking trips also um, besides my work, as I'm working in this infrastructure. And um, I prepared some photos, and let me show it. So, um, we have some um, terrestrial and submarine infrastructure. We already saw different maps. I used one from um, Google Earth. And um, we have some, some uh, cables which are operated by consortiums. Um, I will uh, take up this issue later on. As, um, to hand over what um, Trevor formerly said. Yeah, um, just to see what happens in Germany, the German um, fiber infrastructure is about a bit like, uh, a, bit, a bit like this. Um, Moritz also already showed um, the level three infrastructure, and this is um, uh, an overview of the infrastructure you can um, which is provided in Germany, and you can see that we have some uh, points the infrastructure focuses on. This is in Frankfurt, and this is also um, around in Düsseldorf. Um, the data centers in Frankfurt have already been shown. Um, these are the D6. D6 locations is the largest German or also largest European internet exchange point. And so, um, due um, we have a huge amount of submarine cables running through the, through the um, seas. Um, there are counts between 300 up to also 500 cables, um, depending on their, um, how, how do you call it, um, depending on their... Um, yeah. Depending on the meaning, on their, their importance, that's it. Yes. Um, these cables are running about from, from um, maybe 40 kilometers up to 38,000 kilometers all over the planet. And um, yeah, and the bandwidth increases um, on new services like um, companies try to build their own networks, companies try to build their own internet. As we heard before, Microsoft and Google are building new cables called Maria. Um, other companies like um, Hetzner Online, it's a German holster. Um, they spent a lot of money for a share on a new cable called C-Line. It's provided by a Finnish carrier called Cinea. It has actually landed um, on the beach in Rostock, or near Rostock on the east side of the Baltic Sea, um, in December 2015. So we can see um, many, many of these uh, companies start, really start building their own network. These are named uh, Google's B2 or B4 network. Microsoft does it, Facebook does it, and all the others. Um, we have some submarine cables in the wild. Um, about two years ago, my family, um, as my wife and my, my children went to Hust. It's an island in the Northern Sea. And I thought about, um, oh, I, was, I was a bit bored and didn't want to go back, actually, to Hamburg, where I live and thought, um, just take a trip to, um, to the beach, or I don't know, there's, there's no sandy beach, it's more, more a bit rocky, and I thought about, what is this yellow container? And um, I'm a pretty, um, what should I call it, pretty interested in infrastructure, even if, if you see it all day, and um, went over and saw some sheep, and saw some water, and then on I saw some cable, and I thought, what is this? I took my phone, I've got some maps on my phone, some, some layers where you can see where a cable runs. And um, indeed, I could touch a cable. It's for a technical guy, it's great. It's better than kissing. 
And um, on this map you see, um, there's, a, there's a yellow pin called TIT 40 landing at Deich kilometer. And uh, the kilometer really has a marker, each about 500 meters. And um, you can see another line, uh, Torcus line, right over there, which is a pretty detailed, uh, I, I, I explicitly say pretty detailed, information about where TIT 40 lands there. And this happens near the city of Norden, Norddeich, in Germany at the Northern Sea. Um, I'm pretty sure that the delay of the information where the cable lands is, um, is, is um, uh, technically done so that you have an information about where the cable could be landing, but you can't provide the information exactly. So, um, later on, I thought um, the cable right in this yellow container doesn't make sense as there's no equipment hostable there. There must be more. And um, I thought, where could it go? I started some research and found out there's a Seekabel Endstelle. That's a nice German word. Uh, in English, it's called CCSC, Competen Center for Submarine Cabling. But as it's operated by Deutsche Telekom or former Deutsche Bundespost, they have some pretty nice abbreviations. So they call it Seekabel Endstelle or UBKVRST. They have an abbreviation for everything. Um, the first thing you see when you go there is um, a small letter box. There's not really much written on. There's just um, a label with the, the standard label printer you can buy in any uh, office market where it's written on C-Kabel Endstelle. thought, oh, okay, fine. There must be something interesting. And um, as you see, the building itself, haha, it doesn't have windows. We already saw something like um, in, in California or wherever. And, um, I ran around sometimes around the building and um, couldn't uh, get access to it. So um, I started calling Deutsche Telekom. There's a guy called Jürgen Ritter. He's the manager of the CCSC. Um, he doesn't answer to phone calls, to emails, to uh, contact requests on Xing or LinkedIn or whatever. Um, but I got an answer from his colleague and said it's not possible to visit the location and um, nothing seems to happen there, whatever. There's a nice show on Arte, it's called 20,000 Cables Under the Sea. It's, yeah, of course. Um, you can take a look at the inside of the building. So, um, yeah, I took my trip, um, and I started working for another network carrier, a network operator, and really got in touch by operating these cables. And I found it pretty interesting. It's, it's um, in the Baltic Sea in Germany, and this indeed is um, an open beach drain hole that you can see in the middle. And inside there's, um, as Henrik also uh, tried to find a word for it, it's, it's really called joint box to join the cables inside. And um, that's, a, that's a technical installation to have some splicing works. The cable is running out of the sea. And if it's a short cable and it's not repeated or not power supplied as a large submarine cable system is, um, you can directly splice it and take it to a cable which can be operated on the land route. The cables are pretty expensive. You, you bring it into the sea as they are um, heavy armored on the outside with steel and things like this and copper. And the cable on the land, land route is not that uh, sensitive as it's dug in the earth. And yeah, and um, this manhole is... Uh, really placed on a parking lot for cars. So um, in best times in summer, when you have to get to this manhole, you have to pick up the car standing on this manhole. That's pretty stupid, I think, <laughs> as it's directly at the beach. So um, two weeks ago, I've been to Sud. I've been there four more times, um, several times before, as I'm living in Hamburg, and it's just uh, two and a half up to three hours by train. And it's a nice, um, nice spot in the, for if you want to take a look or just relax, um, have a day out at the sea. Um, on Sud, there's um, one really important cable landing there. It's called the AC-1. It's um, the Atlantic Crossing number one. It's operated by Global, former Global Crossing. It's now level three. And I started taking a trip. Um, I did it in October 2014. I got some pretty wet feet. I got totally wet by walking there around the beach. 
and this time my wife has been um, has been with me, and we ran some e-bikes. We ran some e some e-bikes and said, "Hey, let's take um, let's take a bike trip to the north of Sud and let's buy, take a bike trip to the south of Sud." I didn't mention that I was searching the cable. <laughs> she thought it was holidays. So um, we started taking the trip um, in Westergand. Westergand is a community the, the, uh, of the uh, uh, island of Sylt. There is also a sea cable Endstelle, a CCSC chapter. Um, you can see it there. It is also surprisingly a building without windows, yes. And um, the AC1 route on the land seems to be a big, big, big secret. As I've been there in 2014, um, there's a nice place called Samoa Seepferdchen. Any chapter of the beach has, um, has a name called Zanzibar, Samoa, and things like this. And um, I've been there and took some images. I got my, my handy outside, my mobile, and took some images. And uh, the host of the restaurant ran out and said, hey, shall I call the police? And I said, why? He said, oh, this is a nudist beach. You mustn't take photos here. <laughs> This was pretty nice. You can see this is, um, this is an image uh, taken in about uh, 1999, the left one. It's um, a horizontal driller who takes um, the cable by drilling it to the sea, to the beach manhole. Um, we've seen several photos before. Um, the internet is, is under you at the beach. You're lying on the internet. Um, hope, hopefully no one will dig there with an excavator, but this is the way the cable is running there. The other photo has been taken by me, almost from the same perspective in 2014, and um, you can't see anything of this. So, um, as a technical guy, I'm trying to search things like this, and um, this year, about two weeks ago, maybe it has been a bit windy or things like this, and the sand has been blown away, um, you had the chance to see a manhole at the beach, and this is a Deutsche Telekom manhole, and as Deutsche Telekom operates the chapter uh, from Henrik, please excuse me, it's called Blaberg in Denmark. Is it pronounced this way? Yeah, of course. And um, this is the chapter from Denmark to Sylt, uh, to Germany, and from Germany further on to Katwijk in the Netherlands. So this is one of the beach manholes up there where the cable is running. Yeah, this is also looking pretty nice. This is the same place in the evening with the sundowner, internet everywhere, but you can see it, yes. Um, next one is the biggest danger for the submarine cables, this is, uh, sorry, but this is a joke that only works in German, is not a shark, as we just saw, but it's the Kabeljau. So it, I guess in English it's called codfish, but the joke doesn't work there. Yeah. Um, we've got some, sh um, some images of cut fiber cables. Um, Henrik talked about that, Trevor also talked about that. Um, what is the, um, when, when attacking an infrastructure, whatever, why not attack um, a submarine cable? As you can influence the infrastructure of the entire world by attacking this. It's not just by an anchor of a ship or a thing like this. Um, some cables get stolen, some people try um, to take a saw and cut it out. Um, hilarious guys at their power supply, these cables. Um, the other image is um, a photo I took on my own. It was a pretty sleepless night as the excavator guy um, uh, teared out the cable and um, yeah. So we saw, this, um, we saw this photo. The joke has already been done. But what's behind the cables? Um, behind the cables there are landing stations. Landing stations are, um, in German we call it um, Rasenmäherhütten. It's just, uh, it's just a small building, um, maybe, maybe made of um, um, some, some aluminium or things like this. Not really spectacular. They are standing around about each 80 kilometers. Maybe you've um, often seen a building like this but never realized what is it really. It has some coolers outside, it has some generators maybe, and inside um, there's plenty of fiber. Let me show you that. Um, this, for example, is one of the landfalls of the Atlantic Crossing 1 on the German side. This is where um, a really huge amount of data takes this trip um, from, the, from northern Germany. It's near Flensburg, 
um, down to Frankfurt or other cities like Hamburg, it's passing through Hamburg, it's passing through Frankfurt and uh, provides services, picks up services and brings them further on and also back through this cable. So inside the repeaters, it's, it's not rocket science, it's just fiber, it's light transporting information. You can see um, a lot of patch connections in there, you can see some racks with some um, equipment inside, also got some other images. Um, inside these uh, repeaters there are some so-called DWDM equipment. It's a wavelength uh, multiplexing technique where you can uh, provide many, many services on one fiber pair. The usual uh, submarine cables have about four up to eight fiber pairs and a typical cable on the land route starts at about 72 fibers up to 288 or 864 fibers. So um, you have the chance to pack a huge amount of information into one fiber pair and this is why um, consortiums use these submarine cables. They, have, um, they buy shares or invest in shares maybe on one or two fiber pairs and provide a huge amount of information. So these are just some photos. This is um, a site I'm running on my own. My photo was easy to take. Um, the other one has been out on the repeater site. Um, image a bit larger. It's called DWDM equipment. Not really fascinating. Um, telecommunication needs some power. Henrik also sh already showed it. Um, he showed the, the um, how do you call it, the Schornstein in a chimney, okay, a chimney. Um, and that's the inside of the, the power station, so they, they have backup power solutions. They are usually, usually engines out of ship, built out of ships. Um, they are running on gasoline and start up um, and run about 24 up to 48 hours just to give you the, um, the chance to use the internet whenever you need it. It works 24 seven. Um, Inside these cable stations, there are some cable splitting systems, um, maybe also have some copper installations, also fiber installations, of course. And that's a typical um, uh, German installation, it's called Kabelaufteilungsraum, comes from Deutsche Telekom, it's a nice word. And um, from there or in there, uh, the cables are running into the building um, or running out again and will be worked further on. Sometimes we have to do some things with the cables. Uh, we call it splicing, so what we already saw in the manhole, there's a joint box inside and there's a, a technical way to uh, splice these fibers together to have some fusion splices. And um, that's what this guy is actually doing here, he's handling a cable in the, inside a joint box, just to, to have seen it once. Um, another slide, I don't want to talk about it, as we all know, it happens. Um, interception happens, but um, of course there's a, there's a US submarine uh, ship, it's called Jimmy Carter, and the Navy and NSA say, hey, we are able to, to grab a cable in, in a depth of about 6,000 meters or more and, um, and do some interception on this cable. Uh, this is pretty hilarious. It may work, but it's that, um, it's that expensive and, and free of sense. Um, I think a capable infrastructure is uh, directly happening in data centers or also on land routes, maybe in a manhole inside a chart box, things like this. Um, but what we already saw, it's called the T-Stück or the T-Piece as the telecom um, also has. Um, it's called um, a bending a fiber. So you can really influence or, or um, also read traffic uh, running through fiber without breaking it so no one realizes that you're doing it. It's called, it's a kind of mirroring the information to another port, to another place, to another intelligence. Um, the only thing is that you have to know what information you want to read. Um, in the panel before there was the question, how, um, how long is it estimated to read this information? Um, I guess it's, it's a kind of big data they are collecting and um, in, 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 um, during the years or the months or things like this, I guess they're finding out what they really want to see. And so the, the periods of uh, getting the information are becoming shorter. This is uh, called a bending coupler or Biegekoppler genannt in German. And this is the chance to, 
to um, break out a part of the light and read information with uh, the, the equipment you need for. So um, I was that free to have some other images. Um, they are always repeating. This is um, about the same what um, Moritz saw in Frankfurt, the infrastructure. Moritz took his photo at Interaction in Frankfurt. I took this photo at Interaction in Düsseldorf. It's about the same, same operator, same infrastructure in front of the door. So um, I guess these are all things that are repeating. Yeah. That's all from me. Um, I hope you had, I hope you will have some, some uh, questions following up later on. And wish you a nice evening. Good evening. No presentation from me. I just have a very old-fashioned piece of paper. I need some glasses to read those. Um, when Tatjana first asked me to come and speak at this event, uh, and she said it's about undersea cables, and maybe you can add something to this and talk about uh, cable infrastructure, and I said, well, I don't think I can be part of this event because I don't really know much about undersea cables apart from what we know from the Snowden files. And uh, actually in the inquiry that I'm working in, um, we haven't been able to find out much about the technical and the cable infrastructure. And then she said, but maybe you can actually talk about the process of how you're trying to find out about uh, what's going on in Germany in the inquiry. And that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, describe a little bit the process of what the inquiry is and, uh, and uh, how we work and what we have been able to find out. Um, naturally, in the inquiry, I access some classified information in case anyone in the audience is wondering whether I'm leaking classified information here now. All I'm saying is quoting from public hearings of witnesses or from stuff that has been published in the media, so no danger in case you worry. Um, the parliamentary inquiry of the German parliament uh, has been working for two years now and it came to be basically because um, we had federal elections in Germany just uh, three months after the first Snowden revelations and so uh, the whole topic was quite dominant in the public debate and all the uh, different parties in the parliament were actually quite worried about what actually was going on because people didn't really know so much. Um, and I think because the elections and the election campaign actually happened during the Snowden elections and even though the whole uh, uh, thing didn't matter as much as we would have liked, um, it still mattered enough for them all to make quite a few promises during the election campaigns to want to find out what was going on about the Snowden revelations. And, uh, and so, um, even though we have a actually pretty, um, uh, not very progressive uh, situation in the parliament currently, we have an 80% majority of the Conservative and the Social Democrat Party against a very small opposition. Um, even with this situation, we ended up having such an inquiry and uh, it turns out that until today, I think Germany is the only parliament that has such a parliamentary investigation on actually uh, what, are the, what are the findings and what is actually happening and what is actually true of what Snowden has revealed and, uh, and uh, we all have been wondering about for the past three years. Um, such an inquiry is part of the oversight structure, if you want, of intelligence services, but not part as a, as a regular oversight. The German regular oversight uh, committees, um, and there are several, are not bad. Germany has a 
pretty strong constitution, but at the same time, they are also not very strong. For example, none of the oversight committees that we have have the power to actually just go to the intelligence and demand access, demand to just go and see uh, how they work. The way this is being done is that the oversight committees are totally classified, uh, very much in secret. Nobody knows what they are doing, what they are finding out, and their, their principle is to be accessing or to be hearing from the intelligence about what is going on and to basically comment and maybe every now and then to complain, but nobody will ever find out about this. The parliamentary inquiry, which is a temporary inquiry, has a completely different um, uh, way of working by principle it's a public inquiry and the and the main principle is to discuss uh, and to do the investigation in public which is why we have been having public witness hearings um, for two years now close to two years uh, where we can actually demand to hear certain witnesses the way this works is that um, the parliament has defined the task of the committee basically that is uh, even though it's a five-page document um, and you're all invited to read that, it's in English, it's on the website of the German parliament. Um, basically, the, the main task is to find out how the f intelligence services, um, um, the five eyes, are actually doing surveillance in Germany on Germans, on the German parliament and government as well, but also how the German intelligence is cooperating with the five eyes um, on the surveillance and basically to, to do recommendations, what could be done to, to prevent that from happening if any of the uh, revelations turn out to be true. And what we do next is uh, then demand from the government, okay, now we intend to uh, investigate the technical, the signals intelligence cooperation between German intelligence and the Five Eyes, and please hand us all the documents that you have um, that somehow touch this topic. And uh, um, when Henrik started his keynote earlier and saying, um, I bathe in these documents, and actually they're really a lot, and um, it's one of the main tasks is to make sense of that and to actually to like try to understand what in these huge piles of documents is. That's part of, of our job. And sometimes we also have the assumption that the government is uh, actually throwing huge amounts of documents at us to actually hide the interesting stuff in there. Um, I have a office in the parliament and next to my office I have a second room which is the archive room of all the documents uh, filled with uh, more or less classified information and I think it's impossible for any one person to read all of that in the in the short time that we have. Um, but anyway, so we decide uh, to, to look at signals intelligence cooperation, we get a lot of information and uh, uh, then decide that we want to hear specific witnesses that, uh, for example, work directly in the technical department of the, of the BND, which is the German Foreign Intelligence Service or the Domestic Intelligence Service, and have them explain to us actually how they work, how they technically do their work, but also how they legally justify, according to German law, what they do. And uh, <clears throat> that has been quite revealing because for the signals intelligence, I think that hasn't been actually discussed in that way in public so far. Um, and you can see, and you're all invited to come to the public hearings, and the next one is happening next week on Thursday. You can see when you actually, specifically when we have intelligence witnesses, how very uncomfortable they are talking about these things because it's so far their duty to not talk about their work. Normally nobody knows that they're even in the intelligence and they're not allowed to talk to even their family about these things. And here they are in a public hearing, um, not under oath, but pretty close um, um, and, and need to say the truth, but at the same time are not allowed to reveal too much because they're also bound by specific regulations that they can only talk about the specific topics um, that are being discussed in that specific hearing. Um, when we started doing this, of course, we wanted to have information about the specific cooperation, but it turned out very soon that, uh, and we found very, very soon that Germany actually has secret agreements with the Five Eyes. So the intelligence services in Germany have secret agreements, so-called memorandums of understanding or memorandums of agreement um, with, for example, the NSA. 
and uh, even though these are highly classified, um, I think it's, it's fine to say that in these agreements there is, there is a clause that says that none, nothing of that cooperation can be disclosed to a third party. We've been arguing with the German government since whether the German parliament is actually a third party if the intelligence in the name of the government has an agreement with the five eyes or not. But the government, um, which has the power to hand us documents or not, we cannot just go and take them from their, from their uh, uh, rooms, um, says that uh, in the agreement it's clearly defined that the parliament is a third party. The NSA says exactly the same thing and is actually threatening the German government, so they say. I'm not quite sure how threatened the German government is. I'd rather assume it's a cooperation between the two in the sense of intelligence, um, that if too much information is handed over to the parliament, specifically the inquiry, then they will cut, shut down the cooperation. And there have been ongoing debates, more or less public, about leaks coming out from the investigation um, and, and the, for example, US government then saying, if this continues to happen, then um, we will actually stop specific forms of the cooperation. With that in mind, the government refuses to hand over any documents that are American or even covering any issues of the cooperation, for example, with the Americans or with the British intelligence. And in the very beginning, that left us a bit helpless because said, how are we going to investigate the cooperation if we're not getting any information about it because the US government actually decides uh, that the German parliamentary investigation cannot have these documents that are the foundation of that cooperation, right? So what we did, we started out by looking at a very obvious cooperation which is happening, and you've seen that here in Bad Aibling, which is a former US military base, uh, a satellite interception facility also, but uh, specifically is, is, um, is the physical location of cooperation between the NSA and the BND. Um, and uh, started looking at that. And while we started investigating that, um, a very famous uh, news article was published that uh, is part of a series that was also discussed here earlier and that actually revealed the Operation Iconal that uh, was touched earlier as actually um, in the whole range of revelations and the overall surveillance, a rather very small aspect of cooperation and cable interception, but actually kept us busy for a while because talking about this, it revealed a lot of, from our perspective, rather illegal activities of the foreign intelligence in Germany that just nobody ever knew about because oversight of intelligence in itself, like I said, is always classified, so no one had the chance to, to ever look at this. Um, we spent a while on the Iconal operation, and um, in the two years, uh, we've actually only been able to investigate three, or find out here about three operations uh, that are part of the cooperation between uh, the NSA and the BND, and, um, and Iconal was the largest one of those. The other two have such a high level of classification that for months it was not allowed to even say out the name in the investigative committee which uh, started becoming quite ridiculous because the name was in the media and uh, people talked about it, but when the members of parliament mentioned or asked a question about the Operation Glotyk, the government representatives in the committee got totally nervous and started mumbling and uh, felt very irritated about this. So Glotyk is, is the second operation uh, that we talked about and um, a third one is called the Operation Monkey Shoulder and this is even more highly classified um, just briefly, maybe Iconal was an operation um, that uh, was done between the BND and the NSA where the BND actually accessed cables in Frankfurt uh, at the huge internet exchange um, um, and went to the telecom, uh, telecommunications provider and demanded access to the cable there. The details of how that is being done, some of this has been shown here earlier. And uh, then... Um, took the data from there and uh, handed over after a filtering process that kind of filtered out German communications, handed the rest over to the NSA. Um, 
And that in itself was quite scandalous because the BND is a foreign intelligence and operates outside of Germany. We have a domestic intelligence that is uh, allowed to intercept communication in Germany, but that is in German the Verfassungsschutz, uh, um, the, the Office for the Protection of the Constitution is ironically the name in German. They are allowed to do this in very specific cases, but not, um, not on a large scale. And the BND is doing interception, but outside of Germany. So for them to intercept cables in Germany um, was for the telecom when they actually got there and said, okay, we would like now to, to do this operation and we need you to let us in and to have this specific room and to do the interception for the telecom, apparently not very comfortable situation because they knew that 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 was legally quite tricky, to put it mildly. And so they asked, so do you have any warrant? Do you have any document that actually tells us it's okay for the BND to access the communication in Germany? And then there was a round of debates. We could see that in the files. We had a number of witnesses that after, after a while actually revealed that. Um, and what then happened is that the chancellery decided that they weren't going to get the type of warrant that would have been needed because actually that type of warrant is not provided for in German law. But what they did is they wrote a letter to the telecom and saying, you know, we think this is okay, so please, can you do this, what the BND is asking you to do? And the telecom felt, depending on what level of hierarchy we asked the witnesses, um, more or less uncomfortable about it, but we're also quite convinced that for the lower levels, this was end their career. We personally asked these people, so why did you do this? How did you not have the feeling you were violating the constitution? So they felt very uncomfortable, but blatantly said, I was told to, I was given the order. If I had refused, I would have lost my job. And the higher ranks basically said, we had the feeling if the chancellery says this is okay, then we think this was okay. Legally very weird, but this is what happened. And so this operation took place for a number of years, from 2004 to 2008. And, uh, and then, so the story goes, uh, the government started feeling a bit uncomfortable about this ongoing violation of the constitution. Um, and decided to stop the cooperation and the NSA, so the story goes, was very unhappy and said, mm, this is uh, not what we wanted and why did we give you so much money for all the hardware and software? I'm sure most of you saw Citizen 4, you know the story. The NSA comes and gives the countries hardware and software in exchange for data and this is exactly what's happening. That's what's happening in Germany as well. So the NSA was unhappy because they had invested all this money and uh, so after a few years Germany says, mm, maybe no. This is the story that we get, right? Um, there's a lot of question marks on this story because until today we don't believe that that was the end of that. There was another attempt, uh, the Operation Glowtike, pretty much at the same time, probably done by the CIA and uh, actually accessing a company that's been talked about today as well um, in cooperation with or forcing, depending on who you listen to, uh, the company MCI Worldcom, today Verizon. Um, and when we uh, try to invite witnesses from uh, M former MCI Worldcom, um, the Americans just didn't answer. <laughs> no surprise, so nobody came. And uh, there's a German um, uh, part of MCI, um, now Verizon, and uh, we had someone, but they basically said that they had never heard of this operation, they didn't know anything about it, they cannot answer any questions, so that remains a big mystery because nobody is answering our questions. We had some BND witnesses who basically also said, yeah, there was something going on, but not really very much, and it was not very efficient, and so we stopped it after a few years. And, uh, and then we have a blank. We know there were more operations. We are not getting that information because the US basically doesn't allow the German parliament to have that information or else it's so classified that we can't have it. And that's basically where we are stuck. So you could say that the investigation hasn't gotten us very far at this point. There is a third operation that was planned to happen with the GCHQ, but even getting as far as to understand there was an operation apparently led the UK government to like somewhere short of declaring the next war in Germany. 
Um, so the German government refused to let us have any information about that type of thing. There were some media uh, articles about this. So if you look for the, the Operation Monkey Shoulder, which actually is, so the story goes, named after a certain kind of whiskey, which is made of three components. So we are assuming that the idea was to have UK, US intelligence with the BND to have some kind of operation, probably in Frankfurt. Um, but we couldn't find out any more. This was meant to happen in 2012, 2013, so actually getting very close to the Snowden revelations, and so we think was stopped right after. And um, for the rest, uh, I think more whistleblowers are needed specifically in Germany to understand better about what actually happened after the Operation Iconal and where the data interceptions are happening outside. Um, unfortunately, the investigative task is confined to investigating things between the Five Eyes and the German intelligence, but not with third countries apart from there, and also not in other countries um, outside of that uh, geographic area. So we are not allowed to demand for more, um, more information uh, when it comes to that. It sounds, if you like, maybe like we haven't gotten very far, but actually in the course of this, we have um, been able to define such a large number of m more or less important breaches of German law that uh, things have quieted down a bit now, but the German government got somewhat nervous over the course of, of at least the first year because also a bunch of media leaks kept coming out, partly because of the documents, partly because some of the media teams that were covering the investigation apparently have very good ties inside the government and so were able to get information out of there. Until today, the government accuses specifically the opposition in the investigation of leaking classified information. We've had also serious trouble when it comes to that because we were basically told that if any more leak comes out, if any more article is being published, then there will be legal investigations happening against us for, uh, I don't know what the English word for that is, but uh, basically talking about classified stuff. And uh, we've been answering that, of course, we have access to these classified things, but there's hundreds of people inside the government, inside the BND, who also have access, who are also handling these documents, preparing them for the inquiry in the chancellery. Um, and so it could be hundreds of people who were leaking these types of information. There is no reason to accuse the investigation. However, um, that has been used also as a reason to, to be even more restrictive and to cut down even more on, uh, on what we've been able to access. Um, I was going to maybe talk a little about how the interception actually happens, but I think that has actually been described quite well. Um, if anyone's interested in the, in the like, details, how the filtering works, maybe I can actually even talk about this later or if there are specific questions about that. Um, of course, German data interception by intelligence in Germany is meant to not cover German citizens, just like the US intelligence um, is meant, the foreign intelligence is meant to not intercept information about American citizens. Germany does the same and I'm assuming most of the Western countries have similar sets of laws, so it's actually not quite as outrageous that the US are specifically worried about their citizens because that is how foreign intelligence works. It was described to us in several, in several instances. They are basically free to do what they want to do outside the country, but they're not allowed to, to intercept uh, the, the, the citizens' communication. And then, of course, that gets very tricky. How is that being done? If in the times of internet, how do you actually define what is German communication and what is non-German communication? Um, you, cannot, you cannot really see that, right, in times of packet-switched information, what is a German packet and what is a Turkish packet or whatever. So there were interesting debates about that. We had a very interesting witness once who is uh, actually working for what's called the Federal Authority of Internet Security, uh, the, the Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informationstechnik, who actually described how they certify um, 
the the hardware that's being used by the BND actually does what it should. So, and this guy who's like everyone kind of thought these are the people who actually make sure that that everything is okay technically, explained to us that for one, the way they do it is is basically to do a, a test of plausibility. They get documents and they get a they get a piece of hardware not in use at the moment, so they basically just check whether the documents match the piece of hardware and then the stuff is handed back to the BND and whatever they do with it, nobody knows, um, which raised a number of questions. But this guy was even more interested be interesting because he also explained that basically it's impossible to clearly separate between German and non-German communication. And then when several members of parliament said, yeah, but then how can the BND follow the law? Then basically said, well, actually, I think they can't. Um, <laughs> but that is not something that I can like change. And, uh, and basically, out in a public hearing said that, that the way the practicality of data interception on cables works is, doesn't match the way laws are set up, right? Because you cannot split in the nationalities of, of the communication, which is an ongoing problem and currently is also an option, an option of debate because Germany currently is rediscussing uh, uh, these, these laws governing intelligence. I'm getting told that I need to get to an end. Um, so I think I might just stop here and, uh, and leave, leave that up for questions because I think maybe that might actually be more interesting to discuss whatever has been said so far. Thank you. When someone, yeah, the microphone's on. Great. Um, I will ask like two or three questions and then hand over the question part to the audience. Like I will just start with you, Anna, directly concerning the topic. Like you deal with a lot of technical stuff, like with all this infrastructure stuff. You have this in the documents, we had this in the Snowden documents, and it's kind of really hard to understand. And I think it's even like a lot harder to understand if you're like not a trained tech person, like if you are just like maybe a political scientist who is not like mainly dealing with like what the technological problems are and then there is a problem that you are not even allowed to talk about like most of the stuff that's in the documents if it's not like the Snowden documents which have been published, then how do you do this? Like because I'm also like sitting in those inquiries regularly and listening and sometimes I'm just having those facepalm moments when some of the parliamentarians like Oh, yeah, most of the times not those of the opposition are asking like really stupid questions and again and again and then I'm thinking like there's a lot of stuff and it's hard to understand but how do you yeah go and understand this can you ask experts how are you working with this stuff um, I cannot go and ask experts about classified information because I am not allowed to talk about it um, Often there is a lot of documentation actually in the documents. So if like, even for me, as I would say, I'm something in between technical and non-technical as a political scientist who has been done stuff in this internet for more than 15 years, I think I have a basic understanding of where the internet is, how it works. Um, so uh, some of this stuff, um, uh, is, is not actually that complicated or you can just like take a not too complicated level and actually address witnesses and discuss these things and ask them. I think we spent a number of witness hearings in the beginning to actually understand um, or 
to have the members of parliament understand the difference between digital and analog communication, what is packet switched communication, how, how does that actually work? And we had so many witness hearings and I think you weren't even there at the time where we spent long rounds of, of like technical explanations to, to see how does data interception work, how does the, the, the optical splitting work, and uh, how can stuff be filtered, and how can you actually tell that an email is an email, and that it's uh, German or not, and then very soon it gets from technical to political, because then you get the BND to explain, okay, so how we do this is we go by the, uh, we go by the domain ending, and uh, for phone numbers by the like the pre like country code, um, and then for phone calls, of course, you can tell the language people speak, and then you can ask, okay, but like if you have uh, a communication, even if it's an email, and it's not difficult to actually for you to read, which is, for example, difficult more difficult if if they intercept information that comes from an encrypted messenger. But if it's actually easy to put that together and to actually read how do you, how do you know that this person had that, uh, is communicating in Turkish from a Google Mail account um, and happens to be in Istanbul, right, but happens to also have a German citizenship, which, which is something that can very well happen. How can you tell from reading the email what the nationality of that person is? And then we got to the point where, well, we can't. It's impossible. And so you need to have some basic technical understanding, but often it gets to be very political soon. And for the rest, we have witnesses who do ask them, and we do this three times, and that may be exhausting to the audience, but sometimes it's important for the people who ask the questions to understand. And sometimes also the repetition of questions is important because we need the witnesses to state specific things because in the end we will write a report and we will make this report from what the witnesses have said and so we need specific things to not just be somehow said but we need them clearly to be said so we need to repeat the question. Yep, but what I was kind of aiming at is that you have in this inquiry committee kind of a privilege to like really go deep into the topic and I remember like one publication where which was about the cable tapping in Frankfurt where the people from the G10, G10 commission, like one of the oversight committees, uh, were asked if they were informed about this operation at that time and then they said like, yeah, um, we've been brought to Frankfurt and they showed us some blinking lights and like we really didn't know what was going on and I think like this is a really crucial point and like how do you think like that a parliament oversight can really work or happen without like peeping, having really deep technical knowledge or like really good advisors to help them? I think parliamentary oversight, the way it works in Germany is totally fucked up. Um, <laughs> plain like that for different reasons. One is because the members who are in there are very few, don't have enough time, don't have the expertise, don't actually have assistance with the necessary knowledge and have no idea what's really going on. I think that's become like quite visible in the investigation so they would have to have a lot more people to help them understand things. But the other thing is also that um, the way it works is that the intelligence basically comes and tells them if something is out of the order. So, so the responsibility is all on the intelligence to tell them and the way intelligence works is they don't. Or they do it in a way that you really don't understand where the problem is. We have a similar situation already in Parliament when parliamentarians ask questions to the government and you need to be really good at reading these answers and understanding what they are not saying and exactly what they are omitting. And these are political ma matters, so that's a bit more easy, but when you have no idea what the technology is that they're talking about and you have no chance of understanding, then there is no chance for, for the members of the oversight committees to, to get what's going on. So I think for that reason, it just plainly doesn't work. There is some thoughts about changing that just a little bit now, but uh, I, I still think that makes no sense. And I mean, you could then come to the next step. Okay, so is, is the political aim to improve oversight or should we go for abolishing those corporations? And I would go for the second. Okay, then I have two questions basically to Mark. Like, 
Is this whole like surveillance topic kind of a debate inside like the telecommunications companies? Like we heard like that inside the telecom there was kind of like really skeptical view on this whole Operation Iconal and then there was like this letter and but how is like your work affected by for example the Snowden revelations? Have there been like any change of behavior or discussions and like my second question would be did you ever come in contact with like surveillance equipment. Did you ever see that there was some wiretapping in your work? If you can talk about it. So, First, um, the answer to the second question, um, no. As um, I have, um, I know there is a tapping equipment. It is available, you can buy it. Um, but I've never seen it this way in a data center or also in a facility I'm working on. And you've never seen like signs of someone tapping a cable or uh, no, absolutely not. Um, I'm not really getting in touch with uh, surveillance as I'm uh, basically working um, uh, in, an, in a very passive infrastructure or also a transport network, but we are not accessing the data there as it is encrypted and we are not interested in that. We are just um, the provider of the motorway. Um, people using uh, the parcel services, uh, comparing to parcel services and uh, lorries, they're driving on the motorways. Um, these are our customers. Yep. And the first question? Um, like if there have been any debates about this whole surveillance topic inside like the telecommunications companies or like even if it's like not your daily business, if yep. there is some change? Um, it, I guess it will become daily businesses f um, uh, further you, you step into um, the network layers. Um, if you're uh, getting in touch with a, with a pure passive layer, um, you don't get in touch with any surveillance um, issue. Um, we're hearing about that, we're discussing uh, these things as we are licensed um, by Bundesnetzagentur, it's called Bnetz A, and um, we are also working um, uh, along the TKÜV, it's the Telekommunikationsüberwachungsverordnung, and in case um, there's a federal decision or um, things like this, um, we have to fulfill this. this law. Then my last question to Moritz before I hand over to the audience. Like, when you started to explore this internet, did it kind of change something with your like behavior, how you use the internet or on your views, like how you see like all the political processes, for example, if you maybe see how like vulnerable the internet is because like the cables are lying there partly in the open or if you see like the technical realities and like the yeah, political surroundings of it, did it change anything or was it just like an interesting feeling and... Of course it was an interesting feeling and it was um, yeah, really interesting to go to, to these places and to see how it works but I think what it changed is that I have become more grateful for uh, for the people who um, do good things, like you, for example. Uh, it, feel, it feels really like Sisyphus uh, working, uh, doing all these inquiries and talking to the people and um, not much happening. And um, I'm grateful for uh, people trying to keep the internet free. And But also I'm grateful to people who work uh, that the internet just works because it's still something like magic. Okay, then are there questions? Okay. Is there someone running around with the microphone? Okay, coming. Thanks. Uh, this question, uh, I have two questions actually. Uh, the first is to uh, Mark. Mark, uh, can you explain, it's a technical detail. You said that the submarine cables are made, of, are made up of four or up to eight pairs of fiber, whereas the terrestrial cables go up to 800 pairs of fiber. And why is that? Why don't the submarine cables are like bigger or broader? Yeah, uh, that's a pretty simple um, ex explanation. As um, any signal you transport through the cable or through a fiber pair has to be re-amplified, reshaped, and re, um, uh, reformed and things like this. And this technique is pretty expensive. Um, you can do it um, on a land side pretty simple as you have some power supply there, you have some um, housing and things like this. And just imagine um, you have to do it for one fiber pair. It's 
on the one side it's pretty easy, there's a rack and things like this. And now imagine you have a, um, a cable running through an ocean. There's no power supply, maybe just on an island where you get some power supply, you have to, you, you have to do a remote power supply um, and you have to re-amplify the signets and the repeaters uh, you're using there, this is um, a, sm a really, really small image or rebuilding of a repeater site you have on the land side. I showed an, an image of such a repeater. It looks like a, a missile from an, uh, um, from an aircraft. And um, these this, um, components are pretty, pretty expensive. And that's why we are using a multiplexing technology um, to aggregate a, a huge amount of information just on one fiber pair. Um, just to have an imagination, um, an actual DWDN system uh, is transporting about 116 terabits, 1.6 1 terabits, sorry, um, over just one fiber pair. And that's an incredible amount of data. And that's why um, the, the submarine cables are often just using four up to eight fiber pairs. Second question. Uh, it goes to Anna or Anna. Uh, I don't know who's more. Uh, it's an update on the. Can you give us an update on the lawsuit that the DKIX people uh, started against the BND? <laughs> you would have to ask the DKIX people about this. As far as I know, um, last year, around March or April, there were press publications that they were going to start a lawsuit, but as I'm not sure whether that actually happened, and I don't know what happened after that, because right after this was about to happen, the, what's in Germany quite well known as the selector scandal happened, which kind of showed that the BND is actually spying on German companies, on European politicians, and handing this information to the NSA, and that erupted into a big scandal for months, and then the DKIX people and situation kind of disappeared a bit from, from the public, but I haven't heard about it since, actually. We have one question there. Uh, hello, um, a question for Anne. Um, uh, thank you very much for your excellent uh, um, uh, reporting of the inquiry. Um, I've, uh, I've been to the inquiry a couple of times, but I'm not a German speaker, and uh, I've uh, requested some translation service a couple of times, and uh, it's not f forthcoming. And as a result, as um, it's not re being reported at all in the international press, and as you say, this is the only governmental inquiry, perhaps in the world, looking at their own secret service, and it is very interesting. I'm just wondering if there's any way um, an English translation service could be provided by the German uh, parliament. Um, I agree with you that it's really a shame that there is no international coverage uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, I think, because uh, some of the stuff that we find is quite interesting, but also specifically because I think there was so much focus on the Snowden revelations. Um, and, and now we are doing this work and it's very difficult to follow from outside of Germany. Um, and I wish more international media were interested in this or sent some reporters because I think uh, there are journalists who speak German but can write in English, so that uh, shouldn't be such a problem. I think the parliament will not provide uh, this service because for one, the investigation already is extremely expensive um, and, and the focus of the German parliament is the German people. Um, there are every now and then some translations of documents and the website of the parliament in general is in several languages, but to provide a translation service, um, I doubt that this would be feasible for us as the opposition. We have extremely limited resources because um, as the parliament is made of 80% majority versus 20% opposition, that's exactly also how the resources are distributed, which is why we have very few people, but also very little money for all kinds of things. I wish I could hire some people to help write more about this in whatever language or do some more expertise on this or that, but we just simply don't have that. 
I'm really sorry about it. And for the, for the rest, if anyone has any inclination of covering this in English, um, please come talk to me because we are extremely interested in getting a bit of this outside of Germany. Test? Yeah, it works. Okay. So um, there uh, were mentions that um, like when the U.S. Secret Service needs uh, access to uh, data from Germany and data from Denmark, they basically just pick the Danish data um, from the German uh, data dump and the German data from the Danish data dump. Um, couldn't there be like uh, le legislation of the European Union? Um, enforcing an exclusion of citizens of the European Union. Is this in any way uh, realistic? Um, could, this, could this work? And um, yeah, what, or would there just be more loopholes found by the uh, secret agencies? It's an interesting question. The um, uh, thing is, of course, that national, national legislation is national legislation for one, and, and the relation to the EU uh, uh, framework is something that is for experts, of which I am none. <laughs> um, but the other is a more political question is, are the European governments and is the EU Commission interested in actually stopping this from happening? And what we are facing currently is a government that uh, is telling us, you know, we are having a terrorism threat. And, uh, and whatever you are doing with this investigation is touching national security and stop going deeper because we are having this terrorism threat. And I think that is something that also uh, uh, resounds in the, in the public more or less. Like, it's not like we're having a huge majority of people who are in the street protesting against surveillance currently, right? And the governments know this. So the interest in actually changing these laws and actually stopping that type of surveillance from happening uh, would need a political motivation that I don't see currently. I just want to ask something to Mark because we were uh, having a really funny discussion when we met and he was telling me that uh, some stories of people that were actually trying to steal some cables and I think that was really funny. So maybe if you can tell us a bit more about that. Uh, yes. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, um, first of all, it's pretty dangerous to steal that cables. Um, uh, people People are talking about that um, this happens. Um, these cables are, are high power supplied. Um, there are some stories told um, near the coast of Alexandria and Egypt, or also Myanmar or Birma. Um, I wouldn't believe all those stories, um, as maybe it can also be a kind of masquerading from a kind of censorship in a country to um, provide information that the cable has been corrupted, um, has been broken, or things like this has been even stolen. Um, I guess there is a true story um, near the border of Egypt that the cable has been cut off by two fishing guys. Um, they wanted to sell the cable. They can do that. Um, it's just full of steel and copper and things like this. Um, me and me myself um, had an experience with a uh, damaged cable. I didn't know if this guy wanted to steal it, but it has been uh, a huge vessel um, in the Baltic Sea in about 2012, which must have been 31st of December. It's one of the nicest dates to have a cable failure. And uh, a Turkish vessel um, got, got uh, hung up with his anger in the cable and uh, corrupted it. So. Um, it happens that cables get stolen. Um, I was also, me myself, uh, was involved in an, in an event. It was in Güstrow. Güstrow is a small city near Rostock. And um, some really intelligent guys um, thought they could uh, use, use a, a cable roll, uh, set it on fire, and steal just the copper while burning down all the rest. It was a fiber cable. No copper inside. <laughs> yeah, that's. Someone switches on my microphone. 
I would also have one more question. Hi. Go first. Um, yes. Yeah, go first. Um, my question is is primarily for Moritz, but but um, other people as well. Um, and it, it is about bad metaphors, which Trevor brought up. And you, you mentioned the, the the sort of element of magic, which I feel too, but I think it's a very dangerous, um, it's a dangerous attitude, it's a dangerous metaphor, right? Because there's, there's no magic here, really. I, and it seems like with every new technology, like like the railroad and photography and radio and tell, you know, it was always used that way. Um, and, and in fact, there isn't, there's great materiality, right? There's incredible commercial power, state power, right? So I understand the, I'm, I'm being a little critical here about the, the, the adherence to the idea of magic um, and wondering if you think that's something that needs uh, to be examined. If it's magic or not, of course, I mean, I examined uh, and reported on the internet and how it works, and I, of course, I saw, I saw it's just cables and data centers, and it's not really magic, but um, if you dig into it emotionally, then you feel it's, it's somehow magic, and I felt that very often with the internet, for, for when I used it first in 1994, and I was uh, accessing a website in Japan, it was just uh, something special to me. And I don't see what the danger should be of really loving some medium. Um, I think even I see some of that magic, even though like my job is to investigate surveillance and to see all the evil that it has brought to us. But I mean, uh, I, I still think my motivation is that I'm super angry that they are using our magic, right? <laughs> um, that, that now the government legislation or non-legislation and intelligence interest in secrecy is being used to surveil the people and basically making the internet totally unusable because it becomes very dangerous to be there. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that the original idea of having an open and free tool for communication from one end of the world to the other for people who otherwise would not have had the chance to meet or to talk or to exchange views, uh, that doesn't mean that that's not still a good idea. I think actually that's the energy that tri drives many people who do good things for the internet. I, I definitely can say personally, like working on the Snowden archive and doing this stuff, and, and I don't mean to sort of play a small violin now, but it's really fucking boring and it's taxing over time and trying to get media interested and to pay someone like me is really difficult. Um, so for me, I'm totally egotistical about this. If I didn't have these adventures and being able to travel and go to these places, I would have probably killed myself. I, not, not to be that, it's just really fucking boring. And to get to a point with these stories, it takes forever. And, and I think that's maybe the ultimate strategy just to make it really, really, like that's bureaucracy, right? It, it, it's just really, really boring. And, and that's the biggest challenge. And I, I, I'm sure, Anna, you have the same problem that it's just really difficult to get people interested. And, and to keep up energy when you're, when you're trying to uncover these things. But, but luckily I'm, I'm, I'm in, a, in a position to do so because I have access to privileged information. But I have no um, sort of, I would never assume that anyone would have been interested in that if I didn't have this special access. Perhaps, which would be that the, perhaps there's, um, there's a political I'll call it a political efficacy, right, that we can all use, which is to deploy this, it's an affect, right, the feeling of magic, to deploy it really in, in a positive, maybe it's not to, to deconstruct it, right, not to erase it, but to deploy it in, in a way, um, the same way that fear is being deployed to get people to support surveillance, right, by all the state organizations. Yeah, but I just wanna see also, uh, I, I still wanna see the positive sides of the internet. Course. Okay, then there's one more comment in the back, I think, to that. I guess I can try to expand on this sort of dark side perspective and ask you a question from, from the perspective of 
uh, Henrik said in the first part that it's unlikely that we will be able to block these corporate powers, the people who own the infrastructure, from continuing to utilize it in the way that they have set it up to spy on us and to use it for their own business. And so maybe as a speculative kind of question, um, is it, can you imagine that the states and corporations are using this information in such a way uh, that the internet would no longer become or be a social good because their usage of it will make it the impacts worse on society than how we can use it as individuals. Is, is that a question for me? I guess specifically to the two guys on the panel who are fans of the internet. <laughs> I think it's always, there's no, the reality is not digital. There's no one and zero. It's always gray. It's something. It's always in the shade between. And if, if it's work, if it, if the internet and everything turns out to be evil, it won't be turn out very evil. Just a little bit. And you know, there's always some negative sides, and some positive sides. But we have to fight for the positive sides, and we have to be reminded of the positive sides, so that we keep on uh, fighting for them and that we still use the internet for good. It's just, in the end, of course, as you said, it's just a medium. We can uh, use it for good things, we can use it for bad things, and um, there's a big danger of big corporation just using us, of course. But um, I still believe in the internet and in the energy of the people who use it for good. Okay, maybe this was like a good, if you want to say something? Actually, yes. Yep. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be short. Um, uh, I think I don't have a clear answer, but nobody expected that, right? I think there is some really evil stuff in there, and I haven't even talked about that, but maybe I want to take the chance to just mention that. One of the parts of our investigation is not just generally about surveillance and, and cooperation of intelligence, but specifically how this intelligence is being used in the drone war. So we're also investigating how Germany is actually cooperating in the killing people, right, happening all the time, and how the internet is being part of that. Um, I think we have a pretty clear idea. So it's flat out very evil, and the drone war is just one thing. So there's surveillance, but there's also killing of people. Um, and when I look at that, but also at the surveillance as we see it, I think it's just super fucked up. It's not a safe space anymore. I cannot really advise anyone to use that. On the other hand, also, I don't think we have a choice to not use it, partly because that also makes us targets, but also because in this world today, there, th that option really just doesn't exist. So we need to, to live with it as it is and just need to try and take it back. I don't see any alternative even though that seems not very realistic right now, but I'd like to sometimes compare our fight against surveillance to something that was strong in Germany 30 years ago, which was a struggle against nuclear power, and I see a lot of similarities. Invisible, very deadly, um, very hard to fight against because people told you, yeah, but how are you gonna live without nuclear power? You wanna go back to using candles to light the room and like, Right, It seemed completely unrealistic to go up against that. It was a very long struggle, it's still going on, but I think it was not so bad. And I think we need to face something similar looking at the internet and surveillance and just say, we like that, it can't stay like that. So we need to take it back. Okay, I think these are pretty good words for the end, but before we end the panel, like Mark wants to say something about the exhibition. No event should stop without any commercial aspect. Um, I would like to promote the exhibition on the Technical Museum um, here in Bergen. It's called Das Netz, the Network. Um, it's a permanent exhibition, um, fetching up all the issues from uh, storage to backbone to encryption to surveillance, telematics, and things like this. Um, it's a really nice exhibition. Visit it, have a nice day there. Um, I try to understand my Pagetine dialect in an audio feed and have much fun there.
Okay, then thank you all for discussing here and giving your presentations and very good inputs. And I think the conference will go on tomorrow and there will be some words on that. So first of all, thanks uh, a lot for this uh, great panel. And uh, I think we didn't clap enough, maybe let's do it a bit more. So tomorrow we will uh, go again uh, forward with the discourse of what is the internet. So we have the first uh, keynote of Andrew Bloom that uh, is entitled The Internet Really Behind the Scenes of Our Everyday Lives. And that is moderated by Baron Fix. And then we have uh, a panel so be, uh, after that, so that is uh, Cable Breaks, The Power Below the Surface, with Ingrid Barreton, Helga Tawilsori, Gabriela Sbesto Zaverio, moderated by Jacob Lillemose. So I really invite you to come again uh, tomorrow as well. We will start at uh, 4.30. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for being here today. It was really a great day with a lot of interesting discussion. And uh, we will go on tomorrow. Please come back. Thank you.